have to was Ian. Thanks, Veronica, um, and, and thanks everybody to, for coming. So the correct title is When Things Are Difficult, Finding Compassion. Um, and since we're talking about difficulty, dukkha, um, it's good to start with some sense of, of protection. So um, we'll chant the short version of the recollection of the triple, triple gem, the Araham to stop. Arahaham asambodho bhagava bhutang bhagavan tang abhivade Swakato bhagavata dhammo dhammang namasami Supati Pano Bhagavato Saka Sango Sangang Namami So we're going to start with um, a short practice or rather a sort of cross between a practice and an exploration. Um, and it's going to go in two stages, um, one with our eyes closed and one with our eyes open. <coughs> um, so I'd like to ask you if it's possible, firstly, to put your camera, your video on, so that if, if it's possible for others to see you, that would be great. And secondly, if you haven't already um, got gallery view on Zoom, to put it in gallery view rather than speaker view. Um, so this is a practice about exploring our experience um, and in particular in terms of feeling. So good feeling, pleasant feeling, unpleasant feeling, or neutral feeling. Um, and it's not about changing what we find in our experience. It's about exploring it, um, noticing how it is without judging it, without feeling it should be different from what it is for the moment, just, just being interested in how how we actually are and how we're feeling in response to what we're encountering. So, and with a sense of gentleness towards whatever it is that's going on for us. So, um, if you make yourselves comfortable, and close your eyes, and come home to the body. Noticing the contact with the floor, with whatever you're sitting on. And then just notice how the different parts of the body a feeling. So if there's tension, notice tension, but don't try to change it. Just notice what it feels like. And if there's pleasant feeling in the body, notice that as well. You may find different feelings in different parts.
Letting yourself keep relaxing with whatever you find. And then in the same way, turn your attention to the mind, noticing the feeling quality, pleasant, unpleasant or neutral. And letting yourself relax as best you can with whatever you find. In a moment, I'm going to ask you to open your eyes. And as you, you're doing so, just notice that transition from engaging with the inside world to the outside world. So if you open your eyes and just let them rest on the screen in front of you. And then go through the people on the screen, one by one, meeting each person's eyes in turn. And as you're doing that, just noticing again, the feeling quality that's there, just letting yourself relax, whatever the feeling is, as you go through. Finding a sense of gentleness towards the feeling, whatever it is, and towards whoever it is you're looking at. And close your eyes again, coming back into the body, coming back to breath, quietness, any good feeling. And finish.
so difficulty when things are difficult. So I'm talking here partly about difficulty in the practice, in sitting, breathing practice. Um, I'm, but I'm not, I'm not talking about, as it were, run-of-the-mill hindrances where clearly what we need to do is just bring our minds back to whatever the object of the practice is at that time. I'm talking about when hindrances get real or difficulties or emotions in practice get really difficult and persistent and we need to do something a bit more with them. But I'm also talking about um, everyday life difficulties. I'm talking about things like stress, anxiety, fear, anger, depression, craving for things we can't have, um, grief, aging, or rather our response to aging, nerves before giving a Dhamma talk, um, that kind of thing, the thing we were all, things we're all very familiar with. Um, and these are, as Rob said in his talk last week, when things impinge on us through the senses, we have a very thin skin, if, or no skin at all. They just arouse response within us, feeling response. Um, and we are completely vulnerable to this. We are impacted all the time by our experience that's coming in from outside and also, of course, from, from inside. Um, it, these are like wounds, sometimes very, very slight ones, sometimes much bigger ones. Um, the Buddha himself talked about dukkha as being a dart. So, in a set, so what I'm talking about, of course, is dukkha. Um, and what the Buddha said of his own teaching was that he said, I teach dukkha, I teach suffering, unsatisfactoriness, and I teach the way out of dukkha. So in a sense, the whole of the Buddhist path is about finding a way out of dukkha, is about helping us through difficulty. Um, and we can use any aspect of it. But what I'm going to focus on today is one particular uh, way of engaging with dukkha, which is um, compassion. Um, and it's everyday practical application to just helping us get through our lives. Um, the Buddha him talked of himself as being a physician, as being a healer of those kinds of wounds that I was talking about. Um, and the Dhamma is referred to as Osada, medicine. Um, but if you look at the original Sanskrit meaning of that word, it's a bearer of balm, comfort or refreshment. Um, and there's also, when the Buddha was asked to teach by, after he got enlightened and um, was considering that it was too wearisome for him to teach, he, Brahma Sahampati approached him and begged him to teach. And a word that's used for compassion in that context is anukampa which is literally trembling or shaking along with people. He was asked to teach out of that kind of feeling towards other beings. So I'm going to divide our way of engaging with Dukkha into five steps, very artificially, because as you'll see, the steps are very interwoven with each other um, and they're certainly not sequential although um, I think with the first one is, is where we all have to start um, and 
you'll probably, you will all recognize some of these and use some of these. Um, and we use whichever ones work best for us. So, ah, oh, um, Veronica, oh. could I share my screen? Of course. There we go. <laughs> Thanks. Got it. Um, okay. Right. So the first step is recognizing Dukkha. Um, and this is surprisingly difficult. It's a pr you would think we would know when there's suffering present or, or when there's happiness present. Um, but we don't necessarily. That's why there is actually a practice called mindfulness of, of feeling, pleasant, unpleasant or, or neutral feeling. Um, because it is something we actually need to, to practice. Um, partly, I think, when, when there's generally we're in a good mood and things are fine, we don't like noticing unpleasant feeling. In fact, very often we don't like noticing unpleasant feeling. Um, and when things are difficult and the feeling quality is difficult, then surprisingly, we often tend to dismiss good feeling. Um, and when there is difficult feeling around, it tends to drive hindrances. It tends to produce, for example, agitation um, and, and sense desire and, and other hindrances. And the hindrances that are present at that time make it harder to notice what's actu what are actually actual experiences in that moment. So our reaction to dukkha, um, our natural reaction is tends to be that we want to escape from it. Um, we may try and escape internally in terms of what we do with our minds at that point, or we may try and we often try and escape from it externally. So we go into seeking comfort, it might be comfort eating, it might be um, surfing the net, um, it um, it, or it might be um, expressing our suffering in ways in interaction with people that rebound on us and maybe make things difficult for the other person as well. Um, it might mean that it's hard for us to do things that we know we should be doing or we would like to be doing. Um, but our relationship with them, the sense of difficulty that comes up in relation to them, uh, makes it difficult for us to do that. In other words, when Dukkha is present, one of its effects can be to influence how we behave, hindrances, affecting our behavior. Um, and this affects in subtle ways, sometimes less subtle ways, um, quite a bit of our lives, at, at times at least. Um, and as we all know, this kind of stuff is not easy to deal with. It's ingrained habits of feeling. Um, that are often long conditioned from, from childhood even, in certain, when certain things impact on us or we bring, bring them into our minds, we respond in a particular way. Deeply ingrained conditioning, um, not easy uh, to let go of. And that is our path the path of practice, to actually gradually shift these habits of feeling. So the place to start with practicing with compassion and dukkha is to practice mindfulness of feeling, not just of unpleasant feeling, 
but also of pleasant feeling and just bringing it to mindfulness can feel, it can begin to disentangle us from it. There's a, and to bring it to mindfulness, noticing it, letting it be there, not judging it as best we can, always as best we can. There's a nice um, practice that can go along with mindfulness of feeling, which is when there is good feeling present, even minor good feeling, like you were thirsty and you have a drink, to make a wish to share it with other beings, that sense of relief, for example. And when difficult feeling is present, to make a wish, to be aware that other beings too have this difficult feeling and to be, have a gentle sense of wishing them free of it. The second step is about how we relate to the dukkha when we've found, when we've noticed it. Um, so it's about getting some sort of Dhamma perspective on the dukkha. Um, seeing that it's not personal to us, seeing that it's conditioned, that it's just a, an experience of that moment, that it's human nature, um, something that we share actually with all other beings, because one of the really difficult things about the more severe forms of dukkha is that we often have a sense of being isolated with them. Um, it's where sangha can be very helpful. The sense, it, it helps us to see in a very direct way that other people's experience is not actually that different from ours. Simply knowing that hindrances are something that affect all of us can be very helpful in itself. It's interesting what happens when we notice Dukkha. You'd think again that our response would be to want to get rid of it, which it is, of course, but that doesn't mean that we can easily let go of it. So if you think about the times when you've found things difficult, hindrances in practice that are very persistent, you're angry with somebody, uh, even you're really upset. You can't just, there is some part of you that is really clinging on to that, that is keeping on reproducing it, reproducing it, insisting on it with every moment that passes. It's weird, isn't it? I mean, but again, it's human nature. Um, and so we have a, a strong resistance to letting go and we can have a strong resistance to seeing dukkha in the, from the perspective of, of Dhamma rather than just being tangled up in it. Um, so if we can come back to this is just the experience of this moment, trying not to pile up the future on it when it's expressed as anxiety about the future, trying not to um, get caught up in the past about it with a um, sense of guilt, or but to just see what's there at the time. Um, Sometimes it can be very helpful to put a, to put a hindrance label on it um, because it can help us to disentangle ourselves from, to uh, unidentify with it. So most of the time what we do with when duck is there is we either, and we're not mindful, is we either identify with it um, and we believe everything it's telling us. So when we're angry, we believe that our anger is justified. When we're scared, we believe that there is something really threatening us to be scared of. 
So we either identify with it or we reject it and try and get rid of it. And, and quite often we do both at the same time. Um, so labeling it as a hindrance of a, seeing which hindrance it is and labeling it as that can be helpful. At the same time, um, sometimes we've been taught that hindrances are, <coughs> sorry, are bad things. So we, we feel then that we shouldn't have these hindrances. There's something wrong with us. Um, and that just adds an extra layer of dukkha to the original one. Um, it's, it's not about, so this response of ours from a Dhamma perspective is very much not about fighting ourselves over dukkha. If we get a, into a fight with ourselves about it, one of us is going to lose, probably both of us are going to lose. So it's better to see that actually dukkha is part of the path. There's a saying, no dukkha, no enlightenment. Without dukkha, we would have far less incentive to practice. And as Paul Dennison talks about the hindrances as being, and overcoming them gradually being the path to jhana. So overcoming the hindrances in everyday life is part of the path of, of practice. So the third step is lightening dukkha, is by looking more closely at how we're relating to it. So our basic problem with dukkha is that we don't like it. Um, so we have an intrinsic, um, our, our first response is often to add on an extra layer. So we get anxious about being anxious, we get stressed about being stressed um, and so on. We, we get uncomfortable with the uncomfort, discomfort of dukkha, dukkha of dukkha. Second kind of response we have to it is judgmentalism. We feel we shouldn't have this, we feel inadequate. Um, it doesn't match up to our sense of ourselves. And in some ways we make it harder for ourselves by here, by practicing, I'm a Buddhist, I shouldn't feel this. Um, I'm a, or I'm a Samatha meditator, or heaven help us, I'm a Samatha teacher. I shouldn't feel, I shouldn't have these hindrances. I shouldn't be miserable. Um, or I shouldn't be anxious, or I shouldn't be stressed, and so on. Um, and this sense of trying, trying to maintain a sense of me that um, that somehow doesn't allow for my own vulnerability in this kind of way. Um, that in itself is painful. Um, and that too, that sense of me, is again an area in which we are extremely vulnerable. Um, so the Buddha talked about this um, in a sort of called the dart. He said, because when the untaught ordinary person is being contacted by a painful feeling, he sorrows, grieves and laments. He weeps, beating his breast and becomes distraught. He feels two feelings, a bodily one and a mental one. Suppose they were to strike a man with a dart and then they would strike him immediately with a second dart so that the man would feel a feeling caused by two darts. So too, when the uninstructed ordinary person is being contacted by a painful feeling, he sorrows, grieves and laments. He weeps, beating his breast and becomes distraught. He feels two feelings, a bodily one and a mental one. And we do the same even when, when the 
first feeling, the first start, as it were, is, that, is mental in the first place, we still have the same reaction very often that we add an extra layer on top, an emotional response to the first dart. Um, one way of overcoming this is a, a saying attributed to Nye Boonman, um, at least I've heard it attributed to him, if you're going to sin, sin vigorously. So if you, yeah, you're getting caught in a hindrance, just, just go with it. Um, another way of the thing that helps is to see if we can remind ourselves that actually we are not this kind of superhuman person. Sometimes seeing ourselves as, as a child can help with this. Um, and Sangha can also be a help. That sense that we have people around us with whom our image of ourselves is a very different one. It's about somebody who does know what suffering is and who is doing their best to practice. Not, not that we're always getting there. The path is messy. Um, but actually, we're all muddling along through together. And that can be a very comforting feeling when things are difficult. So another angle on this is these, this sense of self, self-image that we're talking about, caught up with the stories that we're telling ourselves all the time about what, what's going on for us. Stories in which we pay the central, play the central role. Again, Rob was talking about this last week. So we are often the victim. And when things are tough, I'm the victim. The world is against me. Or maybe even poor me, I'm against me, but, but probably that's because the world was against me. Or sometimes it's that we feel that we're in the wrong. Um, so we're, and that's causing us suffering. So actually starting to be interested in the way we construct these self-images and the amount of in, emotional investment we have in them. It's the, it's the beginning of a, if you like, everyday anatta practice. By noticing, we can gradually soften some of our emotional attachment to that sense of self. So the compassion here is about not beating ourselves up more than we have to over the dukkha that we get into. Enough the first start, more than enough. Let's try not to add on to it. So noticing, getting familiar with that idea of second darts, noticing how we do this to ourselves and realizing that maybe we have a choice about it can be very helpful. Um, in, in just softening dukkha, helping us to get through a day in a gentler kind of way. So at this point, lots of, after lots of dukkha, I think it would be good to pause um, and do a, come back to ourselves. Um, just give ourselves a bit of a break in a sense of good feeling. Um, and so I'm going to start with a chant, which is about Dukkha and applying the three signs, Anicca, impermanence, Dukkha, unsatisfactoriness, and Anatta, sense of no self, to Dukkha. Um, if you, I'd like to encourage you to listen with as much stillness as you can find. 
And so if you know the chant, you're very welcome to join in. But if you know it well enough to come at it from some sort of sense of, of stillness. Um, and otherwise, just, just listen. And then um, we'll go into a few minutes of just sitting quietly with however we are and, and moving towards a sense of quietness, stillness, gentleness with whatever you find there in whatever way works best for you. You want to go back to um, yeah. the end of screen share? Yeah, thanks Veronica. Lovely. <laughs> Mayan dang dang mang sotawa e wang janama Jati pedoka jara pedoka maranam pedoka So ke pari deva dukke do mana supaya so pedoka Api ehi sampai ho go do ko, api ehi wipai ho go do ko, yam pe cham na labati tam pi do kang. Sang ke te na pancho pada na kanda do ka, sayati dang. Rupo padana kando, wedano padana kando, sanko rupa sanyo padana kando, sankaro padana kando, winyano padana kando. Ye sang parinyaya daramano so bhagawa evang bahulang savake viniti evang bhagacha panasa bhagavato savake suano sasani bahula pavatati rupang anicham Vedana Nitya Sanya Nitya Sankara Nitya Vinyananga Nitya Rupanganatha Vedana Nitya Sanya Nitya Sankara Nata Vinyanang Nata Sabe Sankara Nitya Sabe Dhamma Nata Te Mayang O Te Namajati Ajaramaranena so ke hi pare de we hi do ke hi do mana se hi upaya se hi Do ko te na do ka pare ta A pe wa na me ma sa ke wa la sa do ka kanda sa Anta ke ri ha pa niya ye ta ti Chiera parine putam pitang bhagavantang saranam gata dhammanja bhagavantang 
Tasa Bhagavatu Sasanam Yata Satyata Balamana Sakaroma Anu Pati Pajama Sasano Pati Pati Ema Sakewala Sadoka Kanda Santa Kiriya And slowly finish. So the first three steps. Um, that I've talked about are very much about getting ourselves through a day in a way that as um, frees us from from dukkha as much as we can. Getting looking after ourselves <coughs> as we go through a day, trying to disentangle ourselves um, from dukkha and from its consequences for ourselves and for other people. Um, the last two steps are more to do with healing the dukkha, both healing it in the sense of whatever the dukkha is in that present moment, but also the roots of it back into our past so that we're gradually releasing the conditioning that has led to that dukkha in the first place. Um, So transforming the dukkha, if you like. So the next step is staying with the dukkha. So moving towards finding some sort of stillness with the dukkha as best we can. And this is about having let go as best we can of the second dart. This is about being in the moment with whatever's there in that very moment. Um, Letting go of agitation, relaxing with the dukkha. And this is fundamental to this part, this step. Can we let ourselves relax with the dukkha that's there and just let it be there? It takes courage and faith But this isn't about coming at it from a kind of self-view of, I should do this, I should be able to do this. It's not about forcing anything. It's about finding a sense of gentleness as best we can with what's there as we turn towards the dukkha rather than turning away from it. And this is about training the heart, opening the heart. Um, Because if we open the heart to our own dukkha, then we become more and more able to open our hearts to the dukkha of others too. Um, What what supports us in this? Um, Becoming aware of the breath, 
So not using the breath to drive out the dukkha, but to, as a background way of holding us um, as we deal with it. Make, relaxing the belly so that we're not holding physical tension that helps to sustain the dukkha. Sometimes coming in, connecting with the whole body, which gives a sense of a solidity in, in holding the dukkha and protecting ourselves from it. Sometimes actually coming into our face, noticing how the face is relating to the dukkha can help. If there's a lot of agitation with the dukkha, then actually movement can help. Um, there's a, a form of walking practice which can be really helpful for this, agitated walking practice, where you, so it's a walking it's a meditation. You're walking up and down as you do for ordinary walking practice and trying not to get distracted by the outside. But you are, if you're angry, you are stomping up and down. You are putting whatever the emotional state is into the way you're moving. And that can help in itself to stop some of the kind of driving thoughts that can often go with agitation and dukkha, um, but it's allowing you to really express it, to give it space, to listen to your dukkha. Um, another way of um, doing the same thing is, is screaming. And um, a couple of my students taught me a new way of doing this last week, which is apparently if you are underwater in a swimming pool and scream, nobody will hear you. So if you really feel you want to let off steam, um, there's a good, and you're in urban spaces, there's a good um, way to do it. Um, and part of the, the, um, part of the effect of, of this is, to let off the blocks that we tend to put on dukkha. So a more, perhaps a more subtle form of second dart is that we slightly block ourselves from feeling it, particularly with, with uh, the hindrance of hate and anger. Very often we apply the hindrance itself to blocking the feeling that's there. And it can be really helpful to give ourselves full permission to feel it. Um, Kanti, patience, patient courage perhaps um, is helpful to not expect that just because we are trying to practice with this dukkha, it's immediately going to go away. Um, to accept that, yup, it's here, it's okay for it to be here in this moment. Um, and that again, is, is, helps us to relax with it, helps us to be able to practice with it. Um, and in fact, all the other part of the ten paramis, the ten perfections, any of them can be helpful in giving us kind of strength, gentleness, um, just to be with the dukkha. And, and finally, finding something that brings us comfort. And here... I'm not talking about comfort eating, although actually allowing ourselves to do things like comfort eating, comfort surfing the, the web, comfort reading, whatever. We're just being human. Sometimes we need to let ourselves off the hook. But I'm talking in this context about Dhamma comfort, about things like devotion, chanting, a sense of dana, generosity to ourselves, about recollecting the Buddha or the Dhamma or the Sangha. Some, or whatever works for us to bring a sense of, of comfort and strength. So this 
stage of staying with Dukkha, it's not easy. Um, and often it's a skill that we build up over time. It, often it starts with just momentarily turning towards Dukkha and starting with small bits of Dukkha. And gradually, as we practice it more, it becomes easier just to, to be able to stay with it. And it's a practice of letting go of barriers that we put up against ourselves. It's, it's letting go of some kind of division within ourselves where, where we're fighting. Um, it's list, giving ourselves space to listen to our dukkha as we might listen to a child. Um, listen to ourselves as a child, because when dukkha is present, very often the the quality of self that's there behind the dukkha is like being a child. Um, it's, it, it, we, it's sometimes interesting and helpful to ask yourself, how old do I feel with this anger or this fear? And the answer might be, I feel like a two-year-old having a tantrum or a five-year-old, you know, the first day at school or whatever. Um, and so allowing ourselves to listen to the dukkha, that's real compassion. And trying to find a sense of gentleness towards ourselves as we do that, uh, bringing in the sense of comfort is really helpful. The fifth stage we could call transforming dukkha. It's applying a remedy. Uh, as we said, applying uh, some form of, of the medicine that the Buddha taught. Um, so the Dhamma offers us different possibilities for doing this. Um, and we can use different ones or, or combine them in different ways um, and at different times, different things are helpful. Um, the first one is samadhi in the sense in other words bringing the mind deepening the stillness deepening the contact with the dukkha itself as the object it can be very helpful to keep the breath in mind so to keep mindfulness of breathing as we're doing this um so it's about going to more and more stillness with the dukkha, finding a space as best we can between, on the one hand, identifying with the dukkha, so believing it, getting tangled up in it, and on the other hand, suppressing the dukkha. If we can find a stillness with the dukkha, where the dukkha itself is still, then at that point, in the middle, the dukkha transforms. It becomes something different. Um, it's a hard place to find that middle place. Most of the time we're on one side or other, we're either tending to identify with it or tending to suppress it. But the closer we get to that point, the more helpful it is. And any movement towards that middle is very helpful. We all have tendencies with Dukkha to do one or other of those things. Some of it, sometimes we tend to suppress or our nature is to suppress and turn away from it. Sometimes, for some of us, our nature is more to identify with it. Um, in either case, over, it's not about, this practice is not about working against our nature. This is about working with our nature, but trying to gradually shift it towards the center. The second, oh, and, and what, I, what I didn't say about um, 
that is that this is one way of understanding the middle way, the middle way between the extremes of indulging and um, mortifying ourselves. The mort suppression being refusing to let ourselves experience what we're experiencing. The second one is Dhammarachaya, investigation, exploration. So this is about feeling our way. It's got that vichara quality of feeling our way around the dukkha. What is the quality of it? Very much not uh, analyzing it or thinking about where it's coming from, not about the cause of it, but what is the actual experience in the moment? And two useful angles on this. Oh, one is to ask yourself, who, who is the me that's feeling this? What quality does this me have? And like I said, it, it might often feel like me being a scared two-year-old. Um, Asking yourself, I find that asking myself how old I feel with this emotion can be a helpful way into that pole of it, looking at the subject, me. There's on the other hand, there's end, there's the object, the thing that is triggering that emotion. So, so if we're anxious, let's say, there is also the thing that is causing the anxiety or the anxiety comes up in relation to that to that object and it's getting the feeling quality of that situation so not that that i'm talking about here trying to find the the taste of the situation that that is so painful for me or so scary for me in that moment so that's another angle that can help. Both of these can help to clarify the dukkha and in clarifying it, help to, to release it. The thir a third way is to apply the three signs. So anicca, impermanence, dukkha, unsatisfactoriness, anatta, no, that we have no fixed self. So anicca and... and in fact, we've been talking, I've been talking about all of these already in a way. And Nietzsche, that sense of this is just what's here in the moment, not piling up the future or the past. It's just here. It is constantly changing and noticing how in every moment we are ourselves reproducing that dukkha actively. Dukkha, so seeing what took it itself, what does it mean? Seeing how it's craving, the craving that underlies it, I don't want this thing threatening me. Or I, I want to be free from this feeling. Or I'm craving for some things I can't have. So exploring that quality of dukkha itself. And then anatta, which I've already talked about, in terms of trying to, to see how I'm constructing myself at that time. And there's a me, there's a, I'm producing a particular version of me that is suffering. And then there's gentleness, very important, finding a sense of comfort, um, a sense of protection, a sense of, so what I was talking about in connection with the fourth step, devotion, um, remembering the part of the metta sutta, which talks about metta as being like the way a mother feels towards her child, for example. And part of that, um, a sort of development of that and more is compassion itself. So taking it as a practice, 
the combination of open-heartedness with that contact with dukkha and with wisdom. Because the suffering we're experiencing is about the boundaries that we, we are shutting ourselves off from ourselves and we're shutting ourselves off from others. Um, and so I'm talking here about compassion as extending that sense of this is something that we share with all beings and wishing all beings to be free from it, to try and loosen our boundaries. Breaking the boundaries, again, this goes back to Ian's talk of a couple of weeks ago, that sense of the Brahma Viharas are precisely about breaking the boundaries within ourselves and between ourselves and other beings. So reminding ourselves that whatever we're feeling, there are at any one moment, there are millions, probably billions of other beings experiencing that same feeling at that time. So, we're going to do a compassion practice um, but to sum up before we do to sum it up what I'm talking about is not easy we don't like working with dukkha it's difficult um, and we need to take it very gently um, there's a lovely quote from um, from the Dhammapada, which used to hang up on the wall at Green Street, actually. Let the wise man remove impurities from himself as a silversmith removes impurities from the silver, one by one, little by little, again and again. And this practicing with dukkha and compassion has very much that quality, again and again and again little by little. So that process I've described, if you like, on one level I've described it as the first three stages as developing what you could call self-aware mindfulness or mindful self-awareness. Getting ourselves in particular through everyday life, looking after ourselves, and the second stage, the, the fourth and fifth stages being around healing and transforming dukkha. But you can take the whole sequence of five stages, um, being a process of moving us gradually from um, towards more and more peace with dukkha so that in the end we can transform it uh, and become free of it. Okay, so the practice we're about to do is, um, is a Tonglen practice, it's a Tibetan practice. Um, and we're going, it goes through a number of, of stages. So the first stage is about just gathering ourselves, if you like, it's samatha. It's gathering ourselves, finding a sense of spaciousness of heart, um, a sense of stillness. Um, the second stage is linking to the breath. So breathing in, dark, heavy, hot, breathing out, spacious, light and refreshing. And I'll remind you of this when we get there. And the third stage is the beginning of the compassion practice itself. So then on the in-breath, you let yourself feel dukkha. And you can do this with any dukkha that just happens to be around for you at the moment, or you could bring to mind 
something, but I would suggest something not too big to start off with. Um, and it's not, it's not, it's trying to let go of any stories associated with that dukkha, but just to go with the feeling of it. And then on the, and so you might like to think before we start of what, what dukkha you are going to bring to mind in this stage of the practice. On the out breath, we send ourselves something that brings comfort or relief in relation to that dukkha, that specific dukkha. So it could be something that's very obviously Dhamma based, it could be recollection of the Buddha or the Dhamma or the Sangha, it could be metta or courage or faith, but it also could be about you know imagining a nice cup of tea or you know, the quality of relaxing in a hot bath or standing on top of a mountain or just whatever happens to work for you in relation to that particular dukkha. And it's very personal. And so again, it might be worth exploring this a bit before we get to, before the practice, but you may find yourself exploring it in the practice too. And that, that's fine. And then, so that, that's breathing in, letting ourselves feel dukkha and breathing out, sending ourselves comfort or relief in relation to the dukkha. And then the fourth stage is letting ourselves feel the dukkha of all the other living beings who are feeling that same feeling that we're feeling, probably not for the same causes, but experiencing that same feeling on the in-breath and sending them the same comfort or relief on the out-breath. So before we actually go on to do that practice, does anybody have any questions about it? So, if you make yourselves comfortable, so we'll do we'll do the summit stage for about ten minutes, and then we'll go on to the the later stages. So I won't give any instructions for the Samatha part if you just do your own practice in whatever way works best for you. So if you just come back to the body with a sense of gentleness, gratitude towards the body. And towards the mind. And begin the Samatha practice. And now start to breathe in, dark, heavy and hot, and breathe out, bright, light and spacious, and refreshing. And now change to breathing in, letting yourself feel dukkha and breathing out, sending yourself 
comfort or relief. Now on the end breath, bring to mind all the other beings feeling that same dukkha. And on the out breath, sending them comfort or relief for it. And come back again to the body and slowly finish. So to, to give due acknowledgement, that practice um, was one I got from Pema Chodron who, and it's the form of Tonglen practice that Trungpa Rinpoche adapted uh, for the West. It's one I found extremely helpful. Um, so that's it. So over to Veronica, I guess. You're muted. Veronica, you're, you're muted. That's okay now. Yeah. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, it was a lovely experience. Thank you so much. And the sun started shining through now. <laughs> And I could hear bird song. I don't know where it came from, whether it was yours or, or at this end. In fact, all the time I could hear it. But thank you. So we've got some time now. If people would like to offer their responses and, and ask any questions, we've got, we've got about 25 minutes. And so I'm going to ask Noel to keep a lookout because there's a lot of uh, people and faces there. And I think you can... You can put your hand up through the reactions button if you want to do it that way. So now's your chance to explore a bit further. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Veronica. And Guy, you were very quick off the mark there, so you're first. Oh, great. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I was just thinking during that about the fact that um, quite often Dukkha involves other people, you know, and it's very easy, you know, there's all seems to be a lot in the Dhamma about how we sort of deal with it when we're sitting and practicing on our own. And uh, But actually it's, I mean, I've got some various situations at the moment where I sort of probably need to learn to deal, sort of assert myself skillfully with other people and say actually what you're doing is upsetting me and so on. I find what I actually do in practice very often is to sort of seethe about things until suddenly I can't bear it anymore and there's an outburst. Um, I just thought I'd mention it really, it's not exactly a question, it's as there does seem to be a lot in Buddhism about turning things back on yourself and reflecting and so on and in fact it is worth acknowledging that it doesn't, you know, our lives involve other people and um, it's very easy to sort of spread our dukkha around if we don't really know how to deal with it. You know, you get upset with people and have an outburst which appears to be about something completely different from what you're really annoyed about. <laughs> and um, it, it, it's not helpful. So um, I, I, that's more of a comment than a question, but I just wondered if you had anything that you could say about that. Thank um, you. I think it's, it's fundamental, actually, what you're talking about, because I think so much of our dukkha comes from relationships with other people um, and you know going right back into childhood so um, it's very much part of that kind of mindful self-awareness that I was talking about um, it's on a kind of practical note something I found really helpful for dealing with those situations is firstly fully acknowledging the dukkha that we're experiencing um, in relation to this other person um, and allowing ourselves to experience it um, but secondly every time we get into an interaction which we feel is difficult um, 
either because we're feeling we're having to hold back and we're, we're feeling helpless with it or because the opposite, we've exploded in some way. Um, it's, I found it, it's really helpful to um, reflect afterwards what we could have said that would have had a different effect. And I um, asked Lance years ago when I was in a difficult, I had a really difficult relationship with a close colleague, how to handle it. Um, and his reply was something on the lines of, you use their own energy to, to um, respond to them. The way I think about it is that in difficult situation relationships we tend to polarize so some we feel that somebody is attacking us and we either respond by attacking back or we tend to not you know be good buddhists and and shrink back um and and then be helpless and feel victimized in the way you were talking about guy mm. um and what we're actually looking for is a way of stepping outside that polarization. Um, so as it was stepping round perhaps beside the other person um, in some way and acknowledging that maybe this is a difficulty between us and maybe we can solve it together. So after that conversation with Lance, um, every time I had a bust up with this particular colleague, I went off and made myself think through the interaction again until I could imagine something I could have said that would have had a much better effect, that would have been assertive in that sense. But assertive not meaning I am standing up against you, but, but trying to find a way that is neither oppositional nor giving in. As it were. Mm -hmm. um, and just the effect of thinking that through every time made me feel less helpless in the situation. But eventually I managed to say, because I kept thinking it through, I managed to say the right thing in the situation and it transformed the relationship. Mm. So, so wonderful. I, I often sort of feel I, I got a good idea of what I should do. It's difficult to sometimes find the courage to actually do it, you know. Yeah. Um, you know, my partner's saying to me, I feel upset, you know, he'll say, I've got something to get off my chest, I feel upset when you do X or something, whereas I find that difficult, you know. It's, it's, it's just interesting in a way that I, I sort of, I'm sure there is stuff about this in the Dhamma, but it doesn't seem to address it quite so directly. It's, you know, it's, it's more looking at looking inwards uh, all the time, whereas it can, you know, as, as we're discussing, you know, interacting with other people is just as important. It, uh, it does address it in terms of the seal. If you look at the four, the, the precept of speech divides into four. Mm. Um, so abstaining from false speech, and that's, that's very relevant because it's not pretending that we feel something that we're not feeling in this situation. Mm. Abstaining from divisive speech, probably, you know, splitting between us and them, probably less relevant here. Abstaining from harsh speech. But it, it, I think it's the one about truthful speech mm. is, is really powerful in this situation. What would it mean to be honest? Mm. And, but to do it in a way that has gentleness. And this process of imagining yourself into saying whatever it is that you think would be helpful gradually enables you to say it. Right. So thank you very much. That's very helpful indeed. Thank you. I just want to say uh, thank you very much for that, Rachel. Um, much earlier on, you mentioned uh, about fear and about anger and about stress, and as though those are quite negative things. But I tend to find that it always kind of depends on the situation. And it's not in so much as they are negative things. It's almost like it's too much. If, it's, if you've got too much fear, then it's more of a negative. But then I need to have some, I need to have some sense of fear so that I can think about the consequences of my actions, for example. 
You know, I mean, you can be angry and you can, you know, you can be very angry, you know, act in a very aggressive way. Or anger can be used as an energy to say, well, I don't like that situation, so here's a donation for this, or um, I don't like that particular in- I don't like that particular circumstance. So this is a solution to it. Um, you know, and stress can sometimes stress can be a very useful tool sometimes. So I guess really what I'm trying to say is, um, is there like a list of like like a five like a five you got like the five hindrances list. Is there like another like opposing list? Do you know what I mean? Of, of positives. Yeah, yeah, because you've got like the five hindrances that go against you. So is there like another list of three or four or five or something that would go? Well, there's the five faculties, mm-hmm. you know, um, faith, energy, mindfulness, concentration, wisdom. Mm. that are, you can oppose to the five hindrances. But in response to what you were saying about the usefulness of anger, fear, stress, mm. um, in, we start from where we're at and we start with, and, and then, yes, some of these things are practically useful, but actually... Um, if you look at so the the in the simile of the saw, the idea that um, an analogy the Buddha gave, if if bandits were chopping you up with a saw, a person who felt any hate on that account would um, would not be following the my teaching is what the Buddha said. In other words, anger in in the long run, anger is not helpful it's what would help in the situations you're describing is compassion so we're aiming to 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 turn anger into compassion but of course you know this is a very very long-term project similarly with stress or fear they're based on a sense of me i have i am vulnerable i am threatened and so um Seeing consequences, absolutely, very central. Um, But ideally, we're heading towards acting from a state of calm, equanimity, um, and and Brahma Viharas at all times. I mean, that's, that's, you know, somewhere off in the far distance, on the horizon of where we're, we're aiming towards. And in the meantime, we muddle through with as much gentleness and compassion towards ourselves as we can, and towards others as we can. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for for the talk. Um, and it's just a few things that came to mind, really. First of all, about about sound. I mean, thank you for the lovely chant that you did. Um, it's it's sound is so important, and as the Tibetan tradition, since we've been doing some practice from Tibetan tradition, of course, um, sound is the last uh, faculty to go. I think when we're dying, so that the Tibetan tradition they sort of whisper things into the ear teachings, because the, the person who's passing away can hear. You know, that's the last sense. Um, and, yeah, I do online yoga, and, and uh, the teacher sings some kind of devotional chant at the end with a stringed instrument. It's really lovely, you know, so sound is such a lovely thing. Um, and the, you know, expressing, you were talking about shouting. It's, it's, you can shout into a pillow as well. That's another way to do it rather than underwater. You can scream into a pillow. But, I mean, I love rock music, so when I used to go to rock that's that's a fantastic way of just you know letting energy uh, diffuse and release so safely. Um, the Tonglen practice, I, I knew I knew about that. I'd learned that in Australia, but also um, it's quite a. I, I always understood it's, it's it's quite an advanced practice because I mean to take in the darkness of the suffering of the world. I mean, I used to try and do it on the tube in the rush hour. <laughs> It's, it's not easy and then purify it and put it back as light it's, it's a 
it's uh, I think it's um, something to use with with a certain degree of a certainly you know the protection element and caution. On that, um, finally, I just want to sorry, I'm just because other people may want to speak and you will want to respond. But the assert the um, what Guy was saying and what Izzy put into the chat box about Marshall Rosenberg, the nonviolent communication. I went on, I was lucky enough after Izzy told me about it long ago to actually see him before he died. He was a wonderful teacher and nonviolent communication is a very useful tool. Also, assertiveness training. They, in the olden days, before the restrictions, we used to be able to go on assertiveness training courses and if it, they may be online, um, they're really useful. Um, and role play is very useful to actually practice speaking assertively rather than aggressive or passive aggressive. So thank you again, Rachel. Thank you. Thanks, Anna. On the Tong Man, this form, I, I know exactly what you mean about that kind of advanced practice. This form was adapted by Trunker specifically for Westerners who were horrified by the idea of taking in other people's suffering. Um, and and it seems to me it doesn't, it, it avoids that kind of thing by actually starting very clearly with our own suffering and then realizing it's shared with others. It's not, so it's a, it's a somewhat different form of Kong Len. Thanks. Um, I think Peter. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, I find quite a useful practice when you've got some physical or mental dukkha in you is to get a sense of how the front of your body feels with tensions in it and then think of it expanding outwards. You're ex opening your edges, maybe a couple of meters. Then do the same to the right, back, left, down and up. So you end up being in a big sphere of mindfulness with your little problem in the middle that's much smaller and it's diluted by all this. Mm. And then if you want, you can then, ex if further than that, if you're doing a practice, you can expand that sphere wrap till it ends up wrapping around the earth mm. and think of kindness and then think of the people and animals suffering. And you can do the four Brahma Viharas that way. Mm. But it's just start by opening out, be more spacious. And little me and my problem is just some something in the middle here, no big deal. But it's still there until it's diluted away, if you like. Mm. Yeah, that sounds a really nice, nice practice. I think, I, I, I suppose I have a, a question there about um, this balance between suppressing and indulging because clear and that could tend a little bit towards ignoring suppressing the the it, i mean i think there's a the mic that could i could imagine a risk with it of, of tending mm -hmm. to stress rather than allow the the feeling to to be felt and heard but it sounds lovely in terms of offering support mm -hmm. as a way of being with suffering yeah, you you kind of got to balance the spacious mindfulness around and what it's around. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. Julia, did you want to speak? Yes. Hello. Thank you very much for the talk. Um, it was a really, really interesting talk, and I was busy taking notes. And I know it's not—it's um, all information, but um, we actually have to practice it, um, and that's the difficulty. But uh, I just—it's probably a very basic question. I, we're talking uh, obviously about holding the middle, um, and that—that that, am I right in thinking that's about ourselves, our mind, um, and also speech, but. For example, and I won't go into details, but I've got a really, really difficult situation in the family and um, what, what little family I have over there. And I do have to take some action. Now, with action, 
you can't be in the middle, can you? I, I've got to take some action. I think even the fact that I, I do have to take some action, otherwise the situation will just go on and on. Yeah. But we're, we're not talking about, can, can, I, can I just check? We're not talking about that, are we? Taking action is something that we have to do anyway in so many situations. Um, but it's how, how I, I take this action that I have to take, which the other person, as Guy was saying, it so often involves other people, the dukkha. The other person will take that as aggressive and so on. Um, but it, I do have to take some action. But I can apply, try to apply the teaching just to myself and to my mind. And I, I'm probably not making much sense. Yeah. And, and to the other, I mean, it sounds really difficult. And, and it's also applying it to the other person. You know, it's compassion for the other as well as yeah. compassion for ourselves. And so maybe there are ways, okay, yes, you're right. If we have to act, we have to act. If somebody else is involved in that, then maybe there is some sort of way of communicating with them around that action, which might mitigate the effect, the negative effects of it. And I know that can, you know, communicate. I'm not saying <laughs> this is an easy <laughs> solution in any way at all to, to, to something that can be very difficult. But in a way, the same sort of thing that um, apply, that um, I was saying to Guy applies here, of thinking about it in terms of how do you, um, how do you find a good way of relating to that person in spite of whatever action it is that needs taking? I suspect also that there's, there's some interesting and helpful stuff going on in the chat, but I haven't had time to, to look at it. Um, so. Thank you. Uh, and, and just doing your best with it and forgiving yourself for, you know, because, it wrong you, you, what you do. Yeah. You know, you're doing your best. Sorry. I, no, sorry, I missed the last thing you said. I'm very sorry. The very last thing you... You're doing your best, you know, as we all do. And, and it doesn't mean we always get it right, but we've done our best. We've done what we can. But the holding the middle... It isn't, is it, about being passive? Because that's what lay, lay people, other people, that, that's what they level against Buddhism, isn't it? They say that it's a passive religion. It, it's people that just, you know, just accept things and don't do anything. But that's not... No, no. It's doing what's needed as best we can without invest, you know, as best we can letting go of the, I'm wonderful because I'm doing this. Mm -hmm. um, just, just doing, I suppose, yeah, doing what we can with it, and, and maybe to have a chat to your to your teacher about it, because then you could talk through the situation in detail and think about together about maybe ways that things that might help. And um, I just wanted to say I did put something in the chat box as Diane um, as Diana mentioned, but I just wanted to I've been listening to the questions coming up, and I just wanted to really encourage people who are having the kinds of issues that that we all have in relationship um, and in terms of communication and this issue about um, how to be balance between being overreactive and and overly passive um marshall rosenberg's nonviolent communication which is also called compassionate communication unfortunately marshall rosenberg has died but he has left behind a really helpful book and a lot of videos that address this is these issues that that we all face in relationship um just brilliantly. And I have to say, it's not a quick fix. You, you need to take it on as a practice, but it is completely compatible with um, what we practice in Buddhism and in Samatha. It is about, it's literally about compassion in daily life. It's about in every moment, in every interaction with people, being mindful, practicing what is um, not an enemy about the person that we're having difficulties with, 
trying to find ways to see, as it were, from the inside of that person's skin, what is going on to cause that what seems to us to be a very aggressive act. Um, because we always see things as an aggressive act when people say things that we don't like. Um, I haven't got time to go into this in detail, but I do encourage anybody who's having difficulties of these kinds in their communication with people, particularly with, with family and loved ones, it is absolutely trans, it can be transformatory and it's all about practicing compassion. In fact, for me, looking into nonviolent communication was an inroad into what compassion was and how to practice it. Uh, you know, obviously you practice your, your, your Brahma Viharas on the cushion, uh, but I think sometimes in daily life, you haven't got the time and the space to think things through, you know, as Rachel's described. Um, and this practice, it is a practice, it, it provides tools um, as well as a very, very deep sense of spiritual investigation and exploration and for me I have to say it was invaluable it has transformed some major difficulties that I've had in my life in terms of um, communicating but some people might say I still haven't learned them but anyway um, a lot better than than perhaps I was some years ago I wish everybody good luck you can find it easily by googling and by going on YouTube really really valuable a complete support to the practice. Thanks, Susie. I'm really glad to have had an opportunity to have um, been able to say this. And I really hope it brings all of you loads of benefit. Okay, I'm conscious of the time. We are past 12 and there are three people still to speak. And there's been some uh, notification from Margaret in, in the chat as well. If people would like to read that. Um, are you okay to take some more questions, uh, Rachel? I'm I'm happy to, but I'm also think it would be nice to do a chant to finish. And I mean, suppose we we finish, and then if anybody wants to stay on and ask more questions, they can. And if they want to leave, they they leave. Okay, let's try that actually, because um, it's then a choice, isn't it? You're not all <laughs> kept longer if you were expecting you had to go so i think we'll take you up on that rachel okay um so charles i'm wondering if you'd be willing to chant this um and it's you notice it's got the word also done medicine in it and what it's saying is paying respect to the buddha jewel the most excellent supreme medicine, the blessing of gods and mankind, through the spiritual energy of the Buddha in safety, may all distresses come to an end and may all dukkhas be calmed in you. And then it says the same for the Dhamma that calms the burning of passion and may all fears be calmed. And the same for the Sangha, worthy of offerings, worthy of hospitality, may all illnesses be calmed. So, Charles, would you be happy to chant that and follow it with the blessing? Sakatoa munda ratanang o sadang o tamang warang hitang de wat manusanang buddha te je na so tina na sam tu panda wa sam be do ha wu pasamen tu te sakatoa tamma ratanang o sadang o tamang warang parila hu pasamanang tamma te je na so tina na sam tu panda wa sam be paya wu pasamen tu te Sankatwa sangaratanang o sadang o tamang warang a hune yang pa hune yang sankate je na so tina na san tu panda wa san be roga u pasamen tu te. 
Bhavatu sabba mangalang rakkantu sabba dewata sabba buddhanu pawe nasada soti bhavantu teya. Bhavatu sabba mangalang rakkantu sabba dewata sabba dhamma nupawe nasada soti bhavantu teya. Bhava tu sabba mangalang rakkantu sabba dewata sabba sanghanu pavena sadasotiya bhavantu te sadhu 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 I'm losing my voice, but one of the things that um, I am, I, um, I lost my sister-in-law the day before yesterday, and I've been feeling tremendous grief, and then the Duke of Edinburgh's death has sort of just compounded all that, and I felt tremendous grief, and losing my voice is some sort of grief thing too, but uh, I just wanted to say it seems to have really soothed just in this short time that you've been talking to us and, and giving us this wonderful talk. And I was particularly taken by the your emphasis on, well, one of the emphasis on the second arrow. Because for me, that's always where the difficulty in the dukkha lies, in the overlaying of it into I shouldn't, I mustn't, uh, it's not right after all this time or whatever. Mm. And it was so lovely to see that quotation to, that you put up on the screen. So thank you so much for that. It was all so helpful. And to tell you the honest truth, I wish I'd heard a talk like that years ago as to how to how to really put the the Buddhist teachings into everyday life. You know, it's I've had to wait thirty years, but maybe it was worth it. Thirty nine years. Thank you so much. <laughs> I'm glad it was helpful, and and I actually share that, Liz. I wish I wish I'd heard that talk many years ago as well, which is why I thought it was worth um, saying. You know. Thank you. I do. Thank you, Rachel. It's it's lovely to see and hear you again. Um, I'm so glad that Lizzie spoke up earlier I saw her comment come up in the chat box uh, because it was bubbling up in me uh, about the practical advice that I stumbled upon ages ago with Marshall Rosenberg and uh, nonviolent communi communication also known as NVC at least on the course I did at the time and it, it's um, uh, just to put into the discussion, really, that um, uh, I, I I remember being really surprised um, when I first came across some sutras in the canon, in the books behind me, and I can see in other people's shelves, that the the Buddha wasn't the author of every sutta <laughs> in, in the canon. And that was uh, uh, both... Uh, one and the same time, a lovely thing, plus the surprise. And I thought, well, this expands something about the Dhamma. And I put that together with the phrase of the Buddha picking up a handful of leaves and saying, look, uh, what I taught you is just this, and there's a whole big Dhamma tree out there. So when I came across uh, Marshall Rosenberg the first time, uh, I, I was sort of stunned. I saw pictures of him and I thought, oh, he actually looks like he could have been in India two and a half thousand years ago. 
uh, quite a severe looking face at the time. But as soon as he opened it and interacted with people on the videos that I saw, the warmth flowed out of him. Of him. And I uh, picked up on what Izzy said about the, the very practical advice. Uh, there's a style which I responded to. I'm not sure if everybody gets onto the chat box. So I've just decided to take a breath and speak <laughs> because uh, uh, I thought those of you, all of you that I see on the screen, will be familiar with the way the Buddha analyzes something with great patience, without fear, into, into steps. And, if you, and, and you, you'll see that in how Marshall Rosenberg addresses things. And I think, well, it's like a, a modern day addition to the canon. Maybe, maybe there could be another collected works. And uh, at the end of which uh, they say, well said, well said to it. Because also in our present age, th those situations uh, that were described in, in, in the suttas then, um, perhaps the modern day ones weren't around, you know, bosses. You were generally working out on the, on the field. You had to do what you had to do. We're also in another day and age where we think about relationships, I, th I think, in a different way. I mean, I can't possibly know to those which were around two and a half thousand years ago. So um, it's just to add to what was said earlier that, um, uh, that they're almost like writings and an approach. And, and compassion is, is very much at the heart of it, uh, that... Uh, somebody could have said uh, to the Buddha, look, I, I, I get up every morning in my shared house and I come downstairs and the sink is full of the washing up. I practice metta, but I, it's not getting anywhere every morning. The, uh, uh, the sink is still full. What do I do? And... In, this, in my scenario, the Buddha turns around to someone, another monk, who, who then proceeds to give an answer. And it, at the heart of it, uh, Guy, it, it is, uh, and others, <laughs> uh, it is actually uh, expressing your needs, saying what you want, which then does put the ball back in the other person's court. And you do get into this... Uh, uh, there's a, you, you then take it from there. How will they react? And all the practice that we've done about love and compassion, I think, supports that um, active thing that you then uh, have to get involved if, if you want a situation to change. And maybe with the colleague at work, you, you, are, you, you say what your needs are. It, 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 this is a, a horribly distilled it all but um you start from there then, then you take it to another uh level or realm and you then go forward from what that reaction is but it it, it helps make the situation uh clear you you know where you are and then can step forward into an exciting new realm because it, it's true what was said earlier i think by julia was it that uh, I, I argue the case sometimes with people who say, well, Buddhism is so passive, you know, you just are taught to accept things. But uh, just as I see that the Buddha was uh, a radical, you know, uh, he was um, seeing what was not right in those times in a far away, spatially as well, he, he strode forward. Uh, so, so we can now. So, um, yeah, that that that's it. <laughs> Thanks. Liz. Yeah, yeah, very helpful. The the NBC stuff, and and but also the four speech precepts. I think do a lot. A, if you really work with them, they're doing a lot of the same things. Yeah, it's, it's to back up, uh, and, and just on that matter. I, I, would have, I, I also thought that in the same realm that there's um, uh, the four, gosh, it's gone out of my head. <laughs> there's another uh, kind of book about the four agreements, yeah. Uh, uh, the four agreements is like 
Uh, I've got his name. Does anybody know? Manuel or... or so is it um, a sort of shamanic? He's a South American shamanic type writer, isn't he? Yes. Uh, although that isn't a dominant feeling of it. What comes over fr from it is... is uh, I could again imagine in the scenario uh, two and a half thousand years ago, somebody might say, can you, can you talk a bit more about right speech? And, and lo and behold, someone might speak up and come up with something called the four agreements. You know, again, another, that, 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 those two are, are my additions to the uh, modern day. They're the new extra leaves <laughs> uh, where, where they're, um, uh, where it's expanded, yeah. Thanks, Cus. In a very practical way, yeah. Thank you. I just wanted to, uh, just, just want to ask a question about about balance because balance, what I, from what I understand, balance is not this thing where it's just everything's exactly in the middle. I, I feel that balance is a, it's a very active process, and it's applying it's applying what's needed. So rather than just being kind of like balance and just sort of being exactly in the middle, kind of being a ski being scared to move. It's actually about it's all about that kind of ebb and flow. So if you Im imagine imagine a seesaw, if a seesaw is exactly still, it's boring. When that seesaw is rocking back and forth, that's when it's more fun. I'm just trying to so have I have I understand that have I understood that properly? I, I agree. Balance? Yeah. I agree. Absolutely. We're constantly finding our way in different circumstances. Sort of, yeah, yeah. Okay. Boring. What should well, I go next? <laughs> go on, okay. Anne. Thank you. <laughs> Just um, speaking, um, uh, listening, obviously, to you, Rachel. I, another beautiful talk from heartfelt and from experience. And the, the line that shook out for me was that this idea of compassion being a shaking and a trembling with others. And that is so, that resonance, and it's as if you sort of match your vibrations with theirs, and it was really, really good. Um, I may have heard it before, but it's nice to hear it again. And I've never done that practice before, and I thought it was wonderful. And it explained something uh, very clearly to me, because that third one, uh, breathing in uh, a feeling of dark and heaviness, I thought, oh, <laughs> that's the opposite of what I normally do in a meta practice. I, you know, breathe in you know, a, a conscious healing breath, which enlivens and feeds every cell in the body and then breathe out any sort of tension and difficulty. And then I thought that net doesn't really fit with compassion. Because <laughs> if yeah, you can't breathe out all your tension to everybody else. So this level, um, although I found it hard to start with, I started doing a compassion and then I, I, uh, I started doing a meta and I changed it then to taking on and and that was so helpful really and something that brought to mind to me um about breathing in more one's own ducker and breathing out relief obviously i've got this son <laughs> of the last 20 years i've got mental health difficulties so it's always him um and i know it doesn't compare to some people's but it's what i have and I've got to breathe out meta, and that helps, you know, in, 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 in meta. But what came to mind was a, a, a comment from Tan Ian years ago when I was talking to him about it. And he said, you should have gratitude uh, because, one, it's not you. <laughs> I thought that sounded very selfish, but I think that's important. And uh, secondly those situations could have been reversed in a former life or another situation. And I thought... That was some insight into it, so that came to mind as well. So thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Anne. And there's something about it's, there's something very powerful about seeing the dukkha as being this moment's dukkha, whatever the feeling is, so that we're not sort of judging it or telling more stories about it or um, evaluating the dukkha. It's just what it is. And that, that when, <laughs> when we can manage it, that, that's very helpful. Thank you. I think we'll, we'll wind up there because the other Anne sent a message 
And I, I want to thank you again. A uh, very deeply personal and emotional dimension to the practice, which is so important, sometimes gets a little bit uh, removed. So thank you. And we'll call it a day there, everyone. Lovely to see everyone and see and speak to you. Okay. So I'll let you go now. Bye, Angela. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Bye. Rachel. Everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye, Lee. Bye. 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 Bye.